welcome all in this uh, teeming attendance on a cold, wet evening is a uh, tribute to the importance of the topics and to the importance of our speaker tonight. Policy Exchange loves to be at the center of uh, events, center of policy making, and uh, the turnout tonight is proof uh, that that continues uh, to be the case, proven, of course, by our continuing uh, program of study only this week producing the outstanding work by our environment unit by Kat Drayson on urban spaces, particularly as it rates to increasing number, the, the amount and number of urban parks. So uh, we continue to make uh, the weather, and I know the Secretary of State plans to say something about that. Owen, always welcome on our platform, um, always in the hot seat from Northern Ireland, but as the shadow Secretary of State, then latterly a Secretary of State, and now perhaps uh, in a, a very differently kind of challenging environment. So thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Well, Dean, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here at Policy Exchange a think tank that does so much to shape and inform debate across a wide range of issues, not least through their latest report, Park Land. Since becoming DEFRA Secretary last year, I've set out my four key priorities for the department. These are to grow the rural economy, improve the environment, and safeguard both plant and animal health. My desire to improve rather than just protect the environment, while at the same time growing the economy, stems from Edmund Burke's description of us as the, quote, temporary possessors and life renters of the earth who must live in a way which doesn't leave to those who come after a ruin instead of a habitation. I've lived in the countryside all my life. I've always been immersed in its activities. And I've seen for myself the impact each and every one of us has on the environment. And that's why I believe that we need to leave our natural environment in a better condition than we inherited it. Our 2011 Natural Environment White Paper, the first of its kind for 20 years, set the goal of being the first generation to leave the natural environment of England in a better state than it inherited. That's a big ambition to which I am strongly committed. And this is not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the only way in which we will secure growth that is both environmentally and economically sustainable. There's no doubt that our natural environment is under pressure. In the UK, populations of farmland birds have declined by 50%, woodland birds by 17% since the 1970s. The State of Nature report, produced by a wide range of environmental organisations earlier this year, set out the scale of the task we face. That said, it's not all doom and gloom. While many species have declined, others have increased significantly in range or abundance over the last two or three decades. These include common and widespread species, as well as some formerly declining species that are conservation priorities, such as the red kite, the otter, or the large blue butterfly. The causes of this overall decline are broadly understood, with loss of habitat and increasingly intense human use of the countryside, not least in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, when agriculture went through a rapid period of modernisation. This is a problem that's faced successive generations and governments. It is not a matter of blaming this government or that organisation. This is a complex and long-term issue that we must, as a society, work together to solve. This is especially the case as we try to deliver more with fewer resources and less taxpayers' money. Yesterday's publication of the Nature Check 2013 report only serves to, show, to demonstrate the, the scale of some of the problems we face. While I would disagree with many of the report's conclusions, it serves a useful purpose in highlighting the continuing limitations of a top-down approach to the natural environment. If we're to make progress in this important area, we must look to a new approach, working with the grain of nature and society. Hence, we must harness the enthusiasm and expertise of the public, farmers, and landowners. I'm a practical 
environmentalist. I find common cause with all those who passionately believe that we have a duty to pass on a better environment than the one we inherited. Too many times, those that say that they're doing their best to protect the environment shy away from the difficult decisions. I won't do that. The environment's much too important to be left to ideologues. So our approach is based on three core principles. First, the environment and the economy are inextricably linked. Second, the natural environment in Britain is overwhelmingly managed by man rather than being abandoned in a homage to Rousseau. And finally, improving the environment is a national challenge requiring a concerted partnership approach. It's not something that taxpayers' money or government alone can fix. And we must harness the rich seam of practical environmentalism that runs through our country. <coughs> Up until recently, the choice has often been portrayed as one of growing the economy or protecting the environment. That's not how I see it. I'm absolutely convinced that we can only improve the environment if we have a growing, prosperous economy. The then Mrs. Thatcher said in a speech to the Royal Society in 1990 that, quote, we must enable all our economies to grow and develop because without growth, you cannot generate the wealth required to pay for the protection of the environment. So I'll never forget traveling, for example, to Albania, seeing brooks running black with oil as a result of the disastrous rule of Enver Hoxha. Economic failure led to environmental failure. In contrast, in China and a host of other countries, where per capita income is now increasing as a result of continuous economic growth, people are taking an interest in their environment for the first time, resulting in more trees being planted. We cannot have sustained economic growth without a healthy, natural environment. Neither can we invest in nature without the resources generated by economic activity. And that's why I want to secure growth and improve the environment in tandem. These two priorities are not mutually exclusive. We need to be able to measure our natural capital and build it into our economic decision making. And that's why we set up the Natural Capital Committee. The committee established in 2012 was one of the headline commitments of the White Paper, and it's the first committee of its kind in the world. The water industry is a prime example of economic investment as environmental investment, of improving the environment while growing the economy. The privatization of our water industry in the late 1980s has secured more than 116 billion pounds of private investment, investment that would never have come from the Exchequer. As a result, we've moved from several of our major rivers being classified in the not too recent past as sterile or biologically dead to our waterways now being cleaner than they've been for decades. We now have otters in every region of the UK. Salmon and trout are returning to rivers and streams where they've not been seen for generations. Earlier this year, I visited Northumbrian Waters Waste Treatment Plant in Howden on Tyneside. Their investment in anaerobic digestion is enabling them to process half a million tons of sewage, which was previously dumped untreated in the North Sea every day. This generates enough electricity to power the equivalent of 8,000 homes and produce a dry fertilizer for local farmers. This investment not only makes economic sense for the company, but it's also helping clean up the Tyne, one of our most industrialized and polluted rivers. Upon my arrival at the site, one of the staff showed me a picture of a large salmon, which he'd caught only yards from where I stood, something that would not have been possible until recently. Looking to the future, there's still more to do, and the water bill will reform the water market still further by removing barriers to competition. That will lead to a more efficient and resilient water industry with lower environmental impacts. It's in the interests of the water companies themselves to continue to invest in reducing leakage, pollution, and unsustainable abstraction. It is not just good for the environment, it's good for business. The privatization of the water industry shows us that we should not be afraid of economic or technological innovation. 
In fact, we should embrace it. Indur Goklani has calculated that if we try to support today's population using the production methods of the 1950s, instead of farming 38% of all land, we would need to use 82%. It's also been estimated that the production of a given quantity of a crop now requires 65% less land than it did in 1961. <coughs> Continued progress and innovation could see us using cultivated land more efficiently, presenting us with exciting opportunities to free up more space for biodiversity and wildlife. The adoption of technology will be key to us meeting the challenge of sustainable intensification, as set out by the government's former chief scientist, Sir John Beddington. Technological advances over the course of the 20th century have also meant that Britain now has three times as much woodland as it did a century ago. Woodland cover in England reached a nadir of 5% at the end of the First World War. Today, it stands at just over 10%, around the same level as when Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales. We believe that government and the forestry sector working together could achieve 12% woodland cover by 2060, an increase equivalent to a county the size of Derbyshire. And the forestry sector is leading the way in demonstrating how a healthy environment and economic growth can go hand in hand. With around two-thirds of the UK's woodland resource in private hands, the importance of working with private individuals to make progress in improving biodiversity cannot be overstated. And the Grown in Britain initiative, led by the forestry industry itself, is working to increase demand for British wood products, thereby increasing investment in the planting and management of woodland. The initiative seeks to provide an economic pull to galvanise landowners to see the many benefits, both economic and environmental, of well-managed woodland. Thanks to Grown in Britain, Heels is stocking a new range of British grown and manufactured ash furniture, and just this relatively small step is supporting 60 jobs, 20 of which are furniture-making apprentices. It's improving the environment, and it's helping business. One policy which I believe has huge potential for improving the environment and placing our biodiversity on a sustainable footing for the future is that of biodiversity offsetting. Offsetting is a measurable way of ensuring that we make good the residual damage to nature caused by development which cannot be avoided or mitigated. This guarantees that there is no net loss to biodiversity from development and can often lead to net gain. It will not change existing safeguards in the planning system, but it makes it quicker and simpler to agree a development's impacts to ensure losses are properly compensated for. Offsetting could help create a ready market for farmers, landowners, and environmental organizations to supply compensation for residual damage to nature, providing long-term opportunities for investing in our habitats and biodiversity. It's incredibly apt that I'm speaking here at Policy Exchange, the think tank that through its Nurturing Nature report has put offsetting on the political agenda and highlighted the real contribution it could make to our natural environment. There's already over 20 other countries using offsetting, and the Ecosystems Market Task Force, chaired by in Cheshire, concluded that we should adopt offsetting as its priority recommendation. Not all of these models would work here, but we're looking closely at the US, Germany, and Australia to see what lessons we can learn. And on a visit earlier this year, I saw different models working well in Australia, and in July, I visited one of our offsetting pilots in Warwickshire. The biodiversity strategy published in 2011 sets out our plan to halt the overall loss of England's biodiversity by 2020. The ultimate aim is to move from a net biodiversity loss to a net gain. The Rural, <coughs> sorry, the rural Development Programme, which invests £400 million a year in agri-environment schemes, <coughs> Sorry this, is already rewarding farmers for providing and improving habitats. Revert to the water industry for a second. <laughs> Good privatised product. <laughs> it might work now. And I see offsetting as a potentially important tool to set alongside this. In a small and heavily populated country such as ours, 
There will always be developments or infrastructure projects that require a trade-off between economic and social benefits and the natural environment. It could be a new housing development that would cover some woodland or a new road crossing a wetland area. And the first question should always be, can the environmental damage be avoided or mitigated? If it can't, then we would look to offsetting to add an equal or greater amount of environmental value to another area. But this isn't something we will rush into without careful consideration. The consultation on our green papers just closed, and I've gathered views from all sides of the debate, from developers, environmental organisations, and the public. This was a genuinely open consultation, and I'm determined to find a solution that works for both the economy and the environment. I'm determined to make sure the planning system allows sensible decisions on development by ensuring that environmental value is considered at the very start. And the ideal outcome is a system that correctly values nature. We know it can work. In Australia, offsetting has reduced the number of applications to develop on that native grassland by 80%. Such a system can provide certainty for both developers and the environment. So moving to the second core principle of our approach, I believe that to build on the successes we've seen in boosting the populations of species, such as the red kite and the otter, we must recognise that the countryside we see today and the landscapes that are part of it have been shaped by man over thousands of years. In this country, there's very little of what can be termed genuine wilderness. Some of our most iconic landscapes, the landscapes from inspired artists and poets across the centuries, are managed landscapes. The Lake District would not look the way it does today without the presence of sheep and the careful management of hill farmers. The Downs would soon return to elders and bracken if it were not for the presence of livestock and active farming. These landscapes not only support our plants and wildlife, they contribute to our health and well-being and attract large numbers of tourists. In rural England, the £33 billion a year tourism industry accounts for 14% of employment and 10% of businesses. Our countryside is something which needs constant management and intervention. The influence of man can be seen in both our flora and fauna. The names of the following species, the barn owl, the harvest mouse, the meadow pipit, the corn bunting, the hedge sparrow, demonstrate the importance of the farm landscape to our wildlife. The American author and conservationist, Aldo Leopold, recognised this when he said, and I quote, the hope for the future lies not in curbing the influence of human occupancy, it's already too late for that, but in creating a better understanding of the extent of that influence and a new ethic for its governance. So the backdrop of a growing population, increased pressure for land for development, and changing farming practices means that this approach is more necessary than ever. It's, after all, human activity that has, across the centuries, removed many of the countryside's natural predators and introduced invasive non-native species. It would therefore be a dereliction of duty for us to shy away from continuing to manage and intervene in our natural environment. The work of organisations such as the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust demonstrate the importance of managing both our landscapes and wildlife populations. The GWCT's Allerton Project demonstrates the real contribution game management on farmland can make to meeting wider environmental objectives. Its Fields for the Future report, published to mark 20 years of the project Loddington in Leicestershire, found that wild pheasants increased fourfold in response to full game management, hare numbers dropped substantially once predator control was withdrawn, and songbird numbers doubled in response to game management, but showed a gradual decline once feeding and predator control was stopped. Individuals such as Philip Merricks are also demonstrating, I'm delighted to see him here tonight, are also demonstrating the importance of addressing all components of conservation management. At his Elmley National Nature Reserve on the Isle of Sheppey, an hour from London, which I had the privilege of visiting on Sunday, predator control is enabling him to achieve lapwing fledging rates that both protect and increase the population. To maintain a stable population, 
Lapwings need to fledge a minimum of approximately 0.7 chicks per adult pair per year. In 2010, he achieved 1.3 fledged chicks per adult pair, whereas the neighbouring nature reserve, where species management is not undertaken, achieved a fledging rate of less than 10% of Merix's rate. So tomorrow, I'll be visiting Lark Rise Farm in Cambridgeshire, the headquarters of the Countryside Restoration Trust. For 20 years, the trust has been demonstrating how farming can coexist and benefit from a countryside rich in wildlife. And in a relatively short time, otters and barn owls returned after an absence of nearly 40 years. The trust is also leading efforts to try and clear a large area of the upper Cam Valley of mink for the benefit of our indigenous wildlife. The scheme has been taken up by a total of 42 landowners, farmers and charities, along a total of 45 miles of watercourses and lakes. As a result of this intervention, 163 mink have been trapped, with water voles beginning to make a comeback, and the number of kingfishers and moorhens on the increase. Wildlife control is also playing a key role in the battle to save the red squirrel, species which has been native to Britain for more than 10,000 years, but has been in decline ever since the more dominant grey squirrel was introduced from North America at the end of the 19th century. Greys also cause significant damage to our woodlands. The Red Squirrel Survival Trust and others have long been working in partnership with local organisations and volunteers to protect and stabilise our existing red squirrel populations. Grey squirrel control is central to their efforts and is starting to yield results. In the northeast, monitoring shows that the red squirrel managed to expand its range by 7% between 2012 and 2013, with the greys' presence in these areas shrinking by as much as 18%. With 70% of all agricultural land in this country under an agri-environment scheme, there are real opportunities for us to begin to redress the current imbalance that exists in our countryside, an imbalance which since 1970 has seen Britain's magpie and crow populations increase by 90 and 81% respectively. We must manage both landscapes and species. And it's against this background that we must acknowledge that the beautiful landscapes and diverse ecosystems the countryside supports will soon fall into disrepair without the presence of thriving communities and businesses. Farmers alone are responsible for managing 75% of the UK's surface area. They are some of our greatest environmentalists from whom we can learn a great deal and with whom we must work in partnership. And that's why it's so important that the British countryside is a living, working one and why I want to make sure that people in rural areas have access to the same services and facilities as people living in urban ones. I believe that the rollout of superfast broadband has the potential to transform rural areas, bridging the age-old gap between the rural and urban. It could be bigger than the advent of the canals, railways, and telephone combined. It will allow businesses to grow and expand. Google estimates that small online businesses can grow up to eight times faster than their offline equivalents. And I've seen brilliant examples, not least the architect's business located in a converted barn right at the top of a Cumbrian fell, designing golfing villas for clients in Nasiriyah. We're investing 1.2 billion to 2015 to connect as many properties as possible, and currently we're connecting 10,000 rural properties a week. And from 2015, there will be a further 250 million to connect even more properties. And we're also investing 150 million to improve mobile phone coverage. We need to recognize the realities of rural life and the constant balancing act that's necessary between different activities. And I believe that we can have long-term growth and improve our environment. And that's my vision. <coughs> to achieve this, we all need to work together, people, environmental groups, businesses, and government. But what we can't do is look to government to have all the answers and turn things around overnight. That's not how nature works. That's not how the economy works. Watercourses, for example, are an important part of the rural landscape from both an environmental and flood prevention perspective. Despite this, the last government and its blind adherence to Rousseauism failed to maintain watercourses or enable land managers to do so. And that's why we're working 
to remove the unnecessary burdens that discourage farmers and landowners from undertaking their own watercourse maintenance. Last month, we launched seven river maintenance pilots across the country to do just this. These pilots are part of the wider catchment-based approach that makes sure the river maintenance and other environmental goals are considered together to achieve the best outcome for farmers, landowners, local communities, and the environment. With effective forward planning, river maintenance activities and their timing can be managed in ways which enhance water quality and support wildlife interests, particularly fisheries. These pilots will help us develop a new, more flexible consenting system for river maintenance by 2015. The third principle of my approach stems from the fact that we must seek to work with the grain of both nature and people. It's increasingly clear that a top-down approach to the natural environment hasn't worked. We must empower, encourage, and utilise our farmers, land managers, and civil society, all of whom have knowledge and experience of where they live and work. These little platoons of practical environmentalism can help us with our ambition to improve the natural environment, leaving it in a better condition than we inherited it. When ash dieback was first discovered, the contribution of the public was invaluable to helping us identify diseased trees and monitor the spread of the disease. There was an innovative use of technology to make this possible, the Kalara mobile phone app. I'm pleased that we're taking this principle forward in the observatory project, which aims to develop an early warning system for pest and disease threats to the UK's trees. This is a partnership between the Forestry Commission and other organisations. The Woodland Trust and National Trust will use their experience to recruit and train a network of volunteers. The volunteers will support scientists by acting as a first line of response to the reports of tree pests and disease sent in by the public. They will screen and filter reported incidents, enabling scientists to focus on those reports of greatest significance. This is a brilliant example of how we can harness the enthusiasm of the public to benefit the natural environment and mobilize people to engage with an area of policy which would normally be considered the preserve of specialists. There are also millions of people across the country who take part in activities such as shooting or angling and who as part of their pastime make a significant contribution to the natural environment. The 2006 PASEC report estimated that two million hectares of land are actively managed for conservation as a result of shooting and the shooting community spends 2.7 million work days on conservation. The 2012 Fishing for Answers report found that 25% of anglers said that they, quote, contributed to environmental or aquatic habitat conservation projects. Many farmers and landowners already see themselves as stewards of the land they own or farm. They're also already working on a landscape or catchment area scale. And in his 2010 review of England's wildlife sites and ecological network, Sir John Lawton identified this as of huge importance to the delivery of a more coherent and resilient wildlife network. If we are to succeed in delivering meaningful environmental benefits, partnership between government, local authorities, landowners and communities will be key. This is especially important when so much of the nation's property, be it farmland or back gardens, is in private hands and often beyond the reach of Whitehall intervention. It's this sort of approach that I want to seek and promote. And that's why we're building local partnerships in a variety of areas, local nature partnerships, nature improvement areas, and the catchment-based approach. This is the best way of directly engaging communities in the management of their local environment. Many of the nature improvement area partnerships are led by voluntary organisations with the aim of creating an environment that's better for wildlife and people. By working across large, discrete areas, this approach can provide a huge range of benefits from flood protection to pollination services. And we've invested 7.5 million over three years to establish 12 areas. For every pound invested, an additional £5.50 has been leveraged. And this is a great example of government and private funding working together. A few weeks ago, I went to see this approach in action in the Nen Valley. It's an area that had one of the highest areas of species extinctions and the lowest amount of land being protected. The NIA is turning this round. They worked to build strong ties with the local nature partnership and the local enterprise partnership. In the first year, they've secured an additional £1 million of investment. An impressive 3,300 days of volunteer time have been mobilised and 1,500 hectares of farmland 
have been added to higher level stewardship schemes. For these partnerships to work, they must enjoy the full cooperation of farmers and landowners. The catchment-based approach has also been rolled out across all of England's 89 river catchments. It will form the principal mechanism to deliver our national water quality targets, and interested parties from the local area will take part in the decision-making process. And we're also applying a landscape-scale approach, or the marine equivalent, to our fisheries. In my 2005 green paper, I described the common fisheries policy as, quote, a biological, environmental, economic, and social disaster. The continental top-down control of our fish stocks, based on little local scientific knowledge or regional flexibility, has, provoked, has proved catastrophic for the sustainability of our seas. And I'm pleased that after three tough years of negotiation, I'm delighted to see Richard Bennion sitting at the back as he was, went right through it, and as part of the historic deal on the CFP, we've been able to secure a move to a more appropriate regionalised system of decision-making. We're also putting an end to the scandal of perfectly edible fish being discarded, which was a key proposal in my green paper, as well as reaching a legally binding commitment to fishing at sustainable levels. This deal will help put our fish stocks and fishing economy on a firm footing for the future, improving the environment and growing the economy. So, this speech asked a question, can we have it all? Can we have growth and improve the environment? The answer is yes. It'll take hard work and cooperation, but we are laying the foundations. It is possible. I'm absolutely convinced that to improve the environment, we need a growing economy. At the same time, we need to avoid growth that erodes our natural capital and therefore our ability to grow in the future. We need to encourage and secure growth which conserves or enhances our natural environment. The countryside is not something that can be preserved in aspic, nor would we wish it to be. It's something of which we are custodians. We must seek as practical environmentalists to improve our habitats and ecosystems, to leave them in a better condition than we found them, and we must not be afraid to intervene. And I believe that by working with the grain of the countryside and harnessing the enthusiasm that millions of people have for nature, be it on their farms or in their back gardens, we can make real progress in boosting our wildlife and biodiversity. Valuing natural capital as the basis of sustainable economic and environmental growth is central to this government's vision. And I look forward to working with you on making that vision a reality. Thank you very much. Secretary of State very kindly agreed to uh, answer questions by way of smoking things out. I just wonder whether there is it. Well, we are a policy exchange, which uh, is where a great many diverse views come. Is there anyone here who does want to say anything for the environmental policies of Enver Osher? If there is anyone. <laughs> I see no takers. I think we're on to the mainstream now. <laughs> Gentlemen in the front row. Uh, name and organisation. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> BBC Current Affairs. Um, you talk about water courses, rivers and aquifers, and you know your huge commitment to making sure those are in good condition. What would you say about the River Ribble in Lancashire? Uh, this government is, uh, you know, is committed to shale gas developments that could be scores, or even hundreds, eventually, of shale gas wells up there um, in the Boland, uh, over the Boland Shale. Now, farmers in the USA, uh, some of them are rather concerned about the cocktail of chemicals which is used to flush out the shale gas. Um, and, you know, uh, in New York State, for instance, concerns about watercourses are very uh, prominent in their de facto moratorium that exists now on shale gas development. So what work are you and DEFRA doing, if any, to investigate uh, those, potent those impacts in the United States, which have caused quite a lot of concern? Uh, well, I've been to the EPA, and they confirmed they had not one single case of water pollution from the two million wells sunk in the United States. So I'm not quite sure where the BBC got its information. I've been to Poland to see a trial uh, test <coughs> 
and I'm leading a coalition of open-minded states uh, in the European Union on the Environment Council because I've made it absolutely clear that this activity could be of enormous long-term economic benefit to this country. We've seen a dramatic reduction in shale uh, in gas prices in the United States, bringing whole industries back which are no longer competitive in China, and they come to the United States because of cheap gas. As a result of which, uh, the per capita carbon output per citizen in the United States is down to 1964 levels. But I made it absolutely clear, we do not get off base one if we are seen to in any way dilute, weaken, or water down our environmental regulations. So we have to be completely clear that this will be done in a rigorous, robust manner. And there are a whole number of European directives which we have to respect, and I'm working closely with Commissioner Potocznik uh, on, or my, my officials are, but I've agreed with him that there will be guidance prepared to see a clear way through the current range of different directives. But I'm absolutely clear, we will lose this, we will lose the public argument if we're in any way trying to cut corners, it'll be done in a robust way as our environmental regulation is across this country and other hydrocarbon areas, but do not underestimate the massive gains to the economy and to some of our very remote rural areas. And our contribution of £100,000 per well and 1% on turnover could be a massive benefit to some remote rural areas. And I can't add all the BBC points you made. Um, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, that's quite true. Uh, they have... Uh, you know, they have an ongoing general investigation, but there are allegations from three states, uh, which led to a big demonstration in Washington uh, in the fall, uh, that uh, specific EPA inquiries into problems in those three states where fracking is going on have been frozen and shelved, and there are quite a number of people who are quite annoyed, a quarter of a million people signed the protest letter that was taken to Washington, I understand. Fine. I went to the EPA, they said they had not a single case of water pollution. They're writing a long report, as you say, which I think they're going to publish in autumn 2014. But I think we should go into this in an open-minded manner, and I repeat again, while I'm around as the Environment Secretary, we are not going to cut any corners. We will do this in a rigorous and robust manner. But I also appreciate that uh, the cheap gas in the States has completely revolutionised the US economy, it frees up the states from dependence on some pretty unpleasant regimes around the world, run by some pretty unpleasant people. And you only have to go to Lithuania and Poland to see their worries about energy security on that front. So I think we should go into this in an open-minded and constructive manner. Um, James Cooper from the Woodland Trust. Thank you for your words about the, um, the forestry sector. I mean, in that spirit, will you undertake to tackle this current situation where it looks like the Woodland Grant Scheme will be closed to new applicants for the next two years as part of the transition problems between rural development plans, which does threaten the Woodland Creation Target to be asserted, um, and also the fight against tree disease? And secondly, just a quick one if I may, in the spirit of the question, can we have it all? For all the people, that's about health as well as wealth. What more can we do working together to, to bring the environment up the public health agenda and get it on the, uh, the radar of public health professionals? Uh, well, well, firstly, we are talking to the Commission about the transition, and it's not, um, position is not quite as black as um, you've outlined. I've, I've seen a letter literally this afternoon that there will be a bridging system. It's incredibly important we keep these things going. We've got our target of a million trees, we're up to 500,000 trees, and we intend to stick to that. Um, and I'm, I, don't forget, I've made you know, plant health our fourth key priority. That has never been done before. No secretary has ever put plants and forests right up there. So, um, I mean, your organisation does fantastic work and all your volunteers were really tremendous last year. And I think your point on health is a really good one. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about it that, uh, and, and Peter Bonfield did really good stuff on this. Yes. We, we, we must bring uh, every citizen nearer trees, and I've talked to Michael Go about forest schools, and I've talked to Jeremy Hunt about forest hospitals, getting people more related to trees. There's absolutely no doubt about it, the health benefits or getting people involved. But um, people like your organisation can be of a huge help to us on that. Uh, yeah, Gareth Morgan from the RSPB. 
Uh, it was good to hear you talking so enthusiastically about getting things right at the local level. And it was good to hear on the radio talking about your visit to Phillips Farm. Um, I think uh, we have to be a little bit careful about equating top-down necessarily with the Albanian approach. You can't get the local right without getting the national framework right. Something like invasive species is a classic example. We will need huge action at the local level to get that right. But unless we get national and international framework rights for those things, we won't be able to get to the bottom of it. So I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about, about the top-down approach in conjunction with the bottom up. Yeah, I think when I mention that, I, I, what I'm saying is you can't just look to me as the Secretary of State and, and my department to sort out the environment. This is a team effort. So an organisation, the RSPB, with over a million members, has a huge part to play in this. You know, your bird castings are incredibly important um, deliverers of information. And all your enthusiasts uh, play a key role. It's a team effort, this. But you've got to work with private landowners, uh, people like Ferret, your, your neighbour or ex-neighbour in the, on Cheppy Island. Um, the point I'm trying to make in this speech, this, it, this is a very broad uh, target we're aiming at. It's not going to be sorted out by anything simplistic from the top or from the bottom. It's a team effort right across. It's also a question on the back. Did I see anyone hand up? Gentlemen at the back. They looked. Richard Benwell, also from the RSPB. Hope you don't mind. Uh, Secretary of State, we've been delighted with some of the work on natural capital accounting as a first step to incorporating the value of the environment into decision making at that top level. Uh, but a lot of your uh, emphasis in the speech today has been about localism. Now, at the local level, uh, the local enterprise partnerships will be uh, more in control of a, a large amount of money in future. And the Neen Valley example that you gave, while excellent, is unfortunately not exempl exemplary of most local enterprise partnerships which don't take into account the environment very much. Do you have a vision for uh, how to incorporate that sort of value of natural capital at the local level, whether it be through businesses or perhaps through other local ecological expertise? Uh, well, to the chagrin of my official, I call it NEN actually, because I went to the Leather Summers College for a year and they call it, the locals called it NEN. Um, the, the area there, I think, is an absolutely brilliant example of how you can build something around a river system. So it actually takes in Northampton, stretch of uh, Northampton, Bedfordshire, and ends up with Peterborough. And I was there with Seth Hillborn from the Wildlife Trust, and, and talking about offsetting. And I, I should have brought it, actually. We've got a very good map showing the patches which are in ELS, the patches in nature, the patches in nothing. And the, the, the way I saw it was through a whole range of different sources of money. Some of it will be pillar two schemes, um, sub to our consultation going ahead uh, and delivering them. Uh, but also, you know, if you have offsets in that area, you could say that every, every building site, if, it, if you couldn't mitigate it, every new road, every extension to a factory, every extension to a farm dairy, could go into a strategic long-term pot. And you could have a really good strategic target over 25 years have a proper structure, and have a real plan to improve the environment. So we, uh, we had this, the other, I mean, the other day I went to the um, North Yorkshire Moors uh, National Park. They've, they've got a few bits and pieces, patches, trying to uh, help encourage the Duke of Burgundy butterfly. And I said to them, you know, if this could become an area of, where, which could receive long-term funds from offsetting, you could have a real plan on it. You could really go to town and dedicate a huge area, have a proper management structure, sort out the predators, sort out the ground, and that's how I see it working. And that, these areas become uh, basic baskets from which everyone can chuck a bit of money in. But I do see offsetting as being a key part of that. But the key thing is the long term. You need a proper long term plan. The gentleman from France has been waiting patiently. Name an organisation. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Price from the CLA. Um, first of all, thank you for your acknowledgement of the contribution that private landowners can make to this agenda. Um, sometimes we've been a little bit hard done by, and it's nice to know what we do being recognised. But more importantly, thanks for your um, reviving interest in biodiversity offsetting. We produced our first report on this in 2009, and it's great to see that it's rising up the agenda. Uh, but two points I'd make. First of all, um, what's this one? Try and keep it simple. Um, there is an awful lot in there which is causing unnecessary concern because it's so complicated. The more we can do to keep it straightforward and don't get hung up on things like great crested newts or hedges, I think the better we'll be. Um, secondly, 
do more to try and explain the benefits of it. What he just said was brilliant, but there are an awful lot of developers who would benefit from it, and an awful lot of Greens whose interests would be served by it, who are starting off on the back foot because they don't understand it. If your department could do more to explain why it's good for the economy and good for the environment, I think the world would be a much better place. Uh, well, happily, policy exchange would be a chance this evening to have another go. Uh, but sadly, our <laughs> consultation's closed. Um, so we may, you may miss the bus. And I, I entirely agree with you. I mean, this, this really is a case of having, of having both. Uh, the clear lesson in Australia, where I saw a scheme, and, and we all know the landscape <coughs> problems, and it's not, it doesn't automatically transfer. But there they have, um, using sophisticated Australian language, they have things called VOTs. Uh, very old trees. And there had been a road scheme 100 miles from where I went, uh, which had, and there was, there was just no way they could mitigate it. They had to drive this road scheme and had taken out 50 VOTs. As a result of which, the road company had had to give a substantial endowment um, to uh, a trust who employed a guy who had given up farming actually. This guy, all this guy did was maintain um, offsets. And there was 250 in this case. Uh, it's not, I, I would hope to improve, actually, because that was actually, what that's going to do? That was going to in, improve the environment of 200 VOTs and take out the invasive things like you know, European pines, which had gone in there. But what was good about that, the road company knew very rapidly. They knew from day one, if they were going to build this road, there was going to be a value put on the VOTs. There was no messing around, there was no escaping it. They knew that. If they, if they couldn't mitigate, they were going to have to put a value on it. But they didn't go to some huge, long legal wrangle they didn't have Swampy clambering around the trees while the legal processes went on and all the lawyers went off on expensive holidays in the Bahamas. They knew this was going to be a clear consequence and they, it massively speeded up the process. And so there was very clear evidence in Australia that, that the developers liked this. They knew there was a cost, but there was clarity and speed and it was cheap. Exactly, and the Germans have got a system that seems to work. Yeah, as well. So I think it's a real game for the developers, for the environment, you know, this brings in, potentially, a shed load of new money. So, things like the NEN Nature Improvement Area, you, as I've just said, you could have a really long-term program of improvement, constantly topped up. Everyone, someone put up a, you know, if they wanted to do an extension of their house and you couldn't mitigate it, fine, a, a bit went in the offset. That's how I see it working. I do really see this as a, a long-term benefit. Exactly. And the trick is to do more. The real trick to sell this is to make sure you do more for the environment than what you've taken out. And I think also very important, the real tricky thing in this is the geography. I think it's got to be within reasonable distance of where people live. People are not going to thank you if you um, put a road through a bit of marshland near Northampton, but the offset's up in Northampton. And I think you've got to do it within reasonable range so people can enjoy the benefits. Exactly. Just, I think, uh, a few more questions maybe taken as a clutch. But, uh, Question, do you mind that you've taken them to the gentleman there at the front? And did I see any other hands up? Two, two in the front. Uh, Ian Orr, the UK Overseas Territories Conservation Forum. I'd like to get your views on an area of huge global biodiversity, which is that in the overseas territories with more than 20 times as of endangered species and habitats. Now, I was very encouraged by your <coughs> If you like, the, the positive approach to what you've got to aim at is, is not just to slowing the loss, but increasing biodiversity. But we do have examples in the overseas territories of very real challenges at the moment. Uh, I think rightly, the British government is putting a lot of money into creating St. Helena's first airport. That, and, and St. Helena has a vast amount of biodiversity, it was appreciated by Darwin. Uh, there was a whole chapter of Arthur Russell's book on island life devoted to St. Helena. But during, during the airport construction, it was meant to be uh, a, a local environment mitigation program in tandem with the airport. How worried are you that it, a year after the airport construction has started, that mitigation program hasn't yet got underway. So I'm next to you. I'm just brief and wholly unqualified to comment. You better write to me. <laughs> um, Simon Evans from Andrew Report, and I'll keep it short. Uh, you made it clear you're quite keen on biodiversity offsetting. 
Uh, first of all, if you're going to have a national scheme, would it need legislation? And when do you see a scheme being in place? Uh, yes, it would need legislation because it, it's going to be a, probably be an addition to the current uh, planning arrangements. But it's a tackle to the existing. So we're not, you know, very important, we're not going to change the current planning arrangements. So the whole mitigation hierarchy, <coughs> which is pretty rigorous, that will have to be gone through. And then something has to be tacked on the top. But uh, we've got 18 months to go. I would like to get moving. But I've got to, I've got to have a look at the consultation. Consultation just finished. I've got to analyse what was in the consultation. So you're hopeful it will be in place before. I am an enthusiast. But I've got to persuade my other colleagues in government. I've got to find parliamentary time. So there's quite a long way to go yet. But I, I'm absolutely convinced, having seen what I saw in Australia, having read. Uh, what others have done, I mean, what Dieter Helm's doing, I mean, a meeting with him, the National Travel Committee, Kerry Tenkate, who's worked in a number of countries, she's a real enthusiast of this. I, I really think it could help. It'll speed up, it'll, it'll speed up the development, it'll save a lot of money wasted on uh, legal costs. Another element, actually, it'll, it will um, save money on sort of token bits of green activity. So I could be for a number of you know, building states where, as part of the deal, a bit of valuable development ground is given away for a token pond or something. That normally rapidly fills up with shopping bags or worse shopping baskets and is abandoned. Far better to get the full value of that land, develop it properly, and put the money, say, into uh, an offset and get real value for it. So I, I'm absolutely clear it will help developers, and I'm absolutely clear that if we manage it well and we keep it simple, and we keep it local, it can deliver improvements for the environment. Final question, where's the only takers? Final question. One last question, gentlemen there. Ben Shaw from Policy, ben Shaw from Policy Service Institute. Um, so you, say you're, you say we must have the road on natural capital in delivering economic growth, and that's obviously to be welcomed. And I'm glad to see you saying that. Um, where are economic growth is dependent on eroding other countries' natural capital? How do we deal with that? What should our role be? My responsibility is for the environment here. Uh, much as I'd like to have world government, in which we dominate our empire. <laughs> uh, we vacated our, our empire some time ago. So I think I have to address my comments to this country rather than other countries. Thank you. Of course, uh, any such uh, event like this which worked seamlessly owes much to those who worked behind the scenes. So I just want to thank very much our events team led by Harry McKenzie and Jennifer Katsaras for all their work in making this all go so smoothly. Can I please join in? Thank you. Very much. It's now my great pleasure to call upon Kate Hoey. MP for Vauxhall Division uh, of Lambeth to uh, deliver the vote of thanks. I think I can say uh, without any dissent here, one of the uh, most loved and respected uh, members of parliament uh, in this country. <laughs> Few things bring about consensus, but Kate's present here does. I've had the privilege of uh, knowing her for many years, as many of you have. Uh, she works brilliantly across uh, all sorts of divides of all political, communal, uh, ideological, and all sorts of others. It's a great privilege to be able to work here. She denies that she was ever my personal trainer many years ago. She says that had she been so, I would have been in a much fitter condition today. <laughs> and I say, okay, thank you for being here. <laughs> And uh, we have known each other for a very long time. And I was, it was a real pleasure to be invited tonight to um, make a, a, just say a few words to thank the Secretary of State for his really, really interesting uh, lecture. And um, I, it was actually made very pleasant for me when he didn't mention GM. So now we, I think we can agree on practically everything. I, uh, we share a lot, uh, the Secretary of State and, and myself, we share a love of Northern Ireland, and we are very sorry that you're no longer in Northern Ireland. And many people who criticised you are now very, very sorry indeed that you're not in Northern Ireland anymore. Um, and we also share particularly a love of Rathen Island in Northern Ireland. Um, we also share a love of hunting, uh, which we won't talk any more about now, but we might talk about <laughs> later. Um, and I think we both share, uh, I would say uh, we're rather on the very sceptic wing on Europe. 
uh, again, which I know as a Secretary of State and as a government minister, you have to be very much on, on message, but I liked your whole passage about fisheries. Um, I think we share the same view on uh, the nonsense of wind farms all over the country. I hope that that is something that they want. But, but I, I worked closely with the Secretary of State uh, way back when I chaired the old party post officers group, and he was its very efficient secretary. And together we lobbied very hard for uh, government to recognise the importance to our rural and urban communities of the post office. And it was clear then that he cared passionately about the countryside. And that is something that, that very much unites us. Uh, we also uh, shared, um, as I said earlier, shared our, our, our interest in, in hunting, and he made some very impassioned speeches during the passage of the hunting bill. But I think his speech tonight showed the depth of knowledge he has of the countryside, and his belief, very, very importantly, that it should be a living, working countryside. And I must say, it is great to have a Secretary of State who isn't a vegetarian. I was delighted to hear uh, that you are visiting uh, one of my favourite projects tomorrow, the Countryside Restorations uh, Lark Rise Farm in Cambridgeshire, run by the amazing Robin Page, who is also a great friend of Grafton Island, so you'll be able to, to share that. And he will, I hope, and given that some of you are from the BBC, I hope he will tell you about the, the ludicrous bias that the BBC has on many country issues, particularly their programme, Countryfied. Um, and I think there you will see how it is perfectly possible to have wildlife friendly farming, which brings back many of our endangered species. Now, I think it was obviously absolutely right to insist that all actions and policies are made on a scientific basis rather than just opinion. Although, of course, not all scientists get it right, as I think the Secretary of State and I would both agree on perhaps some of the science on climate change and so-called evidence on that. But without doubt, groups who campaign on opinion and motion, which then translates into prejudicial legislation, have done no favours for animal welfare or wildlife conservation. And here I must pick out the RSPCA uh, for its ludicrous positions now. And I think it would make those people in the hunting, who in hunting many, many hunt years ago started the RSPCA, literally turn in their grave if they see what the RSPCA is doing these days. But it's of course, I think what the Secretary of State tonight has highlighted, which is so important, is the management of the countryside, a word that's often used, but I think very often misunderstood. It does mean that humans have a duty to ensure that animal populations exist in wide diversity within acceptable numbers and, more importantly, that those populations are healthy. And I think that sums up management and it is a failure to understand that concept which has led to problems with, for example, and I know they're here in altitudes, the RSB and its unfortunate policies on predators and they really do need to be challenged. But your speech tonight showed us that you have come from a, 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 a job in, in Northern Ireland where, in a sort of way you could say, where nothing was black and white, to something where, in your department, I think at the moment everything's black and white uh, in, in terms of the work you're doing on badgers. Um, and, uh, I am, um, I am I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased indeed that you took that job, although we miss you in being in Northern Ireland. I gather that it's the first time the Secretary of State has left a post only to discover that a few, the post of being Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, only to discover that a few months later they had more special branch security <laughs> around them than they did when they were in Northern Ireland. Um, but I welcome very much what you've said tonight. I welcome your determination to stand up to, I think, what sometimes is complete misunderstanding of what goes on in the countryside. And I think everyone here tonight, whether they agree with everything you say or not, will recognise your determination, your bravery, and that warm words are not just enough, as you have said. Thank you.